I'm here with several members of the Faculty of Applied Science who are going to share with you their amazing research and just some of the ways engineers are making an impact in our world. This research is very often interdisciplinary, meaning people from different engineering disciplines or different faculties uh, work together, and they may be from science or medicine or all sorts of different areas. Many of your professors in university will be research faculty, meaning that they spend time in the classroom teaching you, as well as doing research like publishing journal papers and working to solve problems that we face in the world every day. They're taking what they learn in their research and applying it to teach you in class. So hopefully these very short introductions to just some of the research happening in our faculty will give you better insight into the variety of topics a degree in engineering may allow you to explore. Engineering research and the application of this research is truly changing our world for the better. So with that, I'll invite our first research spotlight to the stage. And at the end, you'll be able to use the Q&A in the stage to ask some questions. Great. Really excited to be here and, and with you all. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about my research. Uh, my group focuses in three areas. Um, basically, we're trying to make skin, muscle, and fat but the equivalent for robots and wearable devices. So we're making contractile materials like that we call artificial muscle. We're making a soft rubbery material that, that is artificial skin and can sense uh, similar to the way our own skin senses. And we're making stretchable batteries that can be used in wearable and backup power uh, devices or grid storage. But what I wanna talk about today is work that we're doing around spinal cord and spinal cord regeneration. And this is uh, part of a project led by UBC that includes 30 investigators from around the world. About half of them are at UBC. The spinal cord is what connects our brains to the rest of the body. And when there's a problem with it, when it gets damaged, uh, like shown here, then that connection can be broken or at least uh, not very functional. So what do we do? Uh, first of all, what are the implications? Uh, we all know that there's a lack of mobility, but also a lot of other effects that we might not think of, like challenges with basic things like uh, urination and sweating and blood pressure and all sorts of other things that we take for granted. It's extremely costly as well. And so how, what can we do about it? This has been a big challenge for a long time. What our approach is in, in the program that we've just started, it's a six year program. We're going to this site of injury and in that injured region, we inject using a needle, some smart materials. These are actually very simple materials. Uh, the, the region of damage, where the damage is, the axons are not able to reconnect. And so what we do is we add some tiny rods. These are uh, about a 50th in diameter to that of a hair. We apply a magnetic field to have them align. And then we treat the scarring around the area of injury, and that then helps axons regrow, we hope, uh, make connections to the other side. And in the end, the ultimate goal is to restore some uh, hand motion, uh, some other function to people with spinal cord injury, which uh, has not yet been successfully done. So that gives you an idea of, of the sorts of, of, of one of the major projects that I'm working on al along with colleagues in in medicine, in uh, biology, in zoology, in other areas of engineering, electrical, biomedical. Um, we need all those areas and also in robotics. All those areas are being applied to try and solve one of the great challenges. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A to ask any questions that you might have for our researchers. We'll also have a few minutes at the end to address some questions to the whole group. 
Um, so I don't see any questions just yet. Uh, so I'm going to bring on our next researcher for right now. And John, hopefully we'll have some questions for you at the end. Um, so thank you for joining. And I'm going to bring on our next researcher, Scott. All right, go ahead. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Scott. I am a, a assistant professor in the geological engineering program which is um, actually housed in a science department here at UBC, the Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences Department, which I think is a really cool thing about our engineering program that we get to mingle with uh, a lot of um, scientists who are doing some cool things um, re related to geology, uh, oceanography and atmospheric stuff. Um, I, my research team, we call ourselves the, the UBC Geohazards Research Team or the GRT for short. And um, when I give presentations like this, I like to show uh, pictures of all the students who've gone through our uh, my, my research team in the last few years, um, mostly smiling faces. So it looks like they're having a, a good time. And uh, what, what we do as a research team is we try to develop tools and techniques that help reduce losses that are caused by landslides and related uh, hazards, ma mass movements like, uh, like landslides. And so, um, why is that important uh, for engineers? Um, you know, landslides, uh, I don't know if many people know this, but they kill thousands of people around the world every year. And not only that, but cause billions of dollars in, in damage, um, especially to uh, things like transportation and communication infrastructure. And this map is just showing a snapshot over about a 10 year period uh, recently of fatal landslides that occurred um, in different places around the world. And, and you can see there there is kind of a pattern there. Um, the red zones are areas where there's mountainous um, regions. And mountainous areas with high rainfall, like here in BC, are especially prone to landslides. Um, and if any of you were around uh, the Vancouver area last November, there was a lot of people talk about the, the rains, the atmospheric river and the floods that happened. Um, but that rainstorm actually triggered hundreds of landslides in the mountains nearby. And actually one of my own students was trapped on Highway 7 um, in his car, had to sleep in his car overnight and sent me an email from uh, his car asking to get out of a midterm exam that we had that week. Um, but he had to be lifted out by helicopter and then a uh, float plane to get back to, uh, to Vancouver. And these photos were photos that he took of the landslide that blocked the highway um, there near uh, Agassiz. So what our, our research team does, we go into the mountains to make detailed observations before and after landslides happen. Uh, so we do uh, quite a bit of work out, outdoors, especially through the summer months. Um, and we use some special equipment and you can see one piece of equipment in the photo on the left there um, is a laser scanner. And we use um, laser scanners uh, on tripods like you saw in the previous photo. We also have a drone that carries a, a laser scanner and this equipment allows us actually to see through the trees and make really accurate maps of the ground surface. And that's what you're seeing on the, uh, in the right image there. Um, if you zoomed in on that image, you'd be able to see this. This is showing an area about one kilometer by one kilometer square. Um, and if you zoomed way in on the image, you'd be able to see individual boulders. And the colored area that you see here on the screen is um, evidence of a landslide that has come down um, between the scans that we've taken. And we can get really detailed information about the size of that event um, and, and uh, make uh, inferences about how fast it was going at different points along its path. We also use satellites to look for landslides in areas where we can't actually reach, um, reach them by, by foot or, uh, or vehicle. And so here's just an example of some optical imagery that's available from uh, satellites that we can use to, to look for things with our eyes. We also use uh, sensors um, based on radar that allow us to see through the clouds to, to, uh, to make observations um, when, it, when uh, the sky is cloudy. And all of that data that we collect help us create realistic computer models that engineers can actually use to make predictions. And so what, what you're seeing here are some patterns that we've identified and um, a number of landslides that we've compiled um, mapping from the local mountains. And on the right is a computer model that was developed here at, at UBC that allows us to simulate the flow of a, a landslide moving down a mountain and potentially impacting things at the um, bottom of that slope. 
And so engineers in, in practice actually use these models to make predictions that support um, land use planning. So trying to determine places that are relatively safe for new homes to be constructed and in areas where there may be existing homes or, or infrastructure that could be impacted by landslides. We also use these kinds of models to design um, protection structures. And there's some examples in the photos on the right. Um, and the photo on the upper right is a, is a debris uh, barrier that's actually constructed upstream of Whistler Village that partly protects Whistler Village in case you didn't know that. And so members of our, our research team, they go on to have some pretty fun and rewarding careers, in my opinion, um, ranging from consulting engineering in um, the geological realm, but also a lot of civil engineers come, come through our, uh, our research program. Um, and a lot of uh, students who go through also go on to uh, further research careers. So that's just a snapshot of our, our work. Thanks. Excellent, thank you so much. That was very interesting to find out more about. Um, all right, I'm going to pull up the next researcher now. So I'm going to bring Carolina onto the screen. Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, really excited to be here and uh, hope to get to meet some of you uh, later on. So we're now going to go from uh, mountains to inside your gut. And uh, inside your gut, there's a lot of things that, uh, uh, that happen. Uh, you might uh, be aware of this or not, but uh, inside our gut, we have this uh, teeming community of bacteria and viruses and uh, uh, even fungi that uh, hang out and digest things that we cannot digest and, uh, in fact, keep us healthy. One of the things that we're really excited about uh, this community of bacteria is the fact that whatever they make makes it into our blood system the same way that uh, a pill that you would take by mouth does. And so this really creates a, a very important system for our health, because if you don't have a healthy microbiota, you're also not going to have the right compounds that make it uh, across your entire body. And from the perspective of personalized medicine, this also gives the opportunity of thinking about how can we change this uh, consortium of microbes to better our health. The number of uh, these microbes that are inside us is really astounding. And we're, we're talking about uh, over 10 billion of uh, these bacteria and viruses and fungi. And importantly, they are able to make things that our body just does not know how to make. And in fact, we, we have evolved uh, ever since uh, we've had a gut. Uh, animals have a microbiota as well. So these are, are things that uh, our body is very uh, dependent on for its function and for its health. Uh, and so here, maybe not everyone is familiar with what genes are. These are, are some of uh, the portion of the DNA in our bodies that uh, can make different things. So can, they can produce proteins that they can in turn uh, have different functions. And the microbiota inside us, in fact, has 150 times the number of these genes, the number of this uh, uh, machinery than uh, our own cells have. So this is a, an, an incredible opportunity to uh, make new things that might be important for our health. One of the challenges, though, that has been happening is that with our changed lifestyle that uh, we've had over the past uh, 100 or even more years, is that we've actually changed very much our microbiota. So things like antibiotics uh, or changes in diet and even changes in lifestyle have really changed the way that our microbiota is able to be built. Uh, and uh, ways in which you can change the, the microbiota is even as, as small as uh, uh, moving to uh, a different country and changing the diet or being in the same country and, and changing a diet. So some of these uh, changes have triggered uh, a lot of diseases that our ancestors didn't even have names for. So a lot of the chronic diseases, allergies, uh, um, immune disorders, and these chronic disorders uh, that uh, didn't exist before are now starting to happen. And we're finding out that they happened through the microbiota because we now don't have the right bacteria to make the right products that our body needs to be healthy. So in, in my lab, uh, we study how we can uh, ameliorate the system, and we use a lot of engineering to do this. So we're interested in understanding how the microbiota changes disease and how we can make it better, uh, as well as how diseases change the microbiota, and so to understand uh, how we can balance these things out. We also do a lot of microbiota engineering, uh, and we'll talk about this uh, in a couple of slides, but how can we actually modify our microbiota to be healthier? Um, as part of the engineering, we also do technology development where we scale down uh, some uh, uh, laboratory processes so that we can do them better and cheaper. And we also look at how uh, we can uh, 
modify uh, our microbiota with other microbiota members. So sometimes viruses uh, are do not attack us and they attack bacteria. So how can we leverage this to change the microbiota? And one of the things that I think is most fun uh, from my perspective for being in bioengineering is the fact that there's so many different tools and so many different approaches that we take. And uh, this makes the, the research really fun. So we we go from approaches that like uh, single cell approaches, uh, sequencing all the way to imaging and developing uh, new ways of uh, looking at these systems uh, in, uh, in patients. So just to tell you a little bit briefly about how we actually modify the microbiota, we can both do this uh, at the level of uh, an individual cell. So we change the, the genome of these microbes in order to tell us what they're going through as they go through the gut. But we also can do community engineering. So there's microbes that we've lost because of our changed lifestyle. Can we reintroduce them back? And what does that mean for the community and uh, for the health of, uh, of ourselves? So from the perspective of uh, um, individual cells, something that we can do is, for example, ask bacteria to tell us whether there's a disease present. So bacteria are very sensitive to their environment and they will start reporting on uh, their um, uh, behave differently depending on what environment they're in. So if we actually link these changes uh, uh, to molecules we can detect, for example, we can make uh, some bacteria glow different colors or report in uh, their genome itself so we can sequence it and see what changes are happening, we can actually have a, a much higher resolution way of determining diseases. Uh, for example, we're doing this uh, uh, by looking at how our microbes in, uh, in the gut itself, how they're responding to their environment. So here you see uh, a picture. This is a section from, from a gut. And uh, here the cells in blue are our own tissue cells. And you can see that they're separated from our microbiota by this thick mucus layer. And one of the things that uh, we're uh, uh, allowing the, the microbiota to tell us now is whether there is malabsorption. So whether, for example, if someone is lactose intolerant or whether someone uh, uh, is, uh, is, has not the ability of, of digesting something, the microbes can now tell us before the symptoms even arise. Uh, finally, I mentioned having this technology development. Uh, one of the things that uh, we work a lot on is trying to miniaturize uh, what we do in the lab uh, to the micro scale. So this is done with microfluidics, which is uh, exactly what it sounds like, is taking uh, fluidic processes and making them uh, in uh, devices that uh, fit within the palm of your hand. Uh, so here on the left, uh, you can see this mixer that has all these valves uh, that allow us to uh, uh, mix components that are very expensive drugs and uh, can do these experiments much more cheaply and in much higher throughput. So we can test a lot more conditions at the same time. And uh, on the right side, uh, uh, this is a, a chip that allows us to do a lot of these experiments and, uh, and actually address in the little chambers here, uh, there are different experiments that uh, get set up. Um, to give you some examples of, like, of things that we can look at with uh, our microbes, uh, we can, for example, image them as they get uh, invaded by these phages. So here the cells are growing, but then what you can see is that they start exploding. And this is because they have been uh, infected by phage and, and the phage is now being released uh, upon uh, this explosion. We can also monitor how the cells respond uh, to different types of drugs. So here you can see the cells that almost look like they're pulsing and uh, they have really interesting mechanical properties that uh, uh, we can study to see how they respond and how they uh, may be able to tolerate uh, or, or be killed if it's a pathogen uh, from different types of drugs. Um, so uh, to end, uh, uh, all of the work that uh, that I'm presenting has been done uh, from uh, um, students in, in my lab, and it's uh, such a fun, uh, engaging, and uh, interactive environment to be in, uh, in biomedical engineering. And I, I really hope that you will come check us out. I, I'm really uh, excited about uh, uh, both the school as a whole, uh, as well as just the, in generally being a UBC. It, it's a it's a really really fun environment, and I, I really hope you'll uh, yeah you'll give it a thought. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. This is also my, my Twitter handle if uh, you have questions beyond uh, this presentation. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we'll jump into the next researcher now. And a reminder to use that Q&A to ask any questions about any of our research spotlights that you've seen so far. I know that there's a couple questions been asked already and we'll kind of wait till the end and we will uh, address all of those Q&As. So thank you so much and I'll bring on the next uh, research spotlight now. Hello everyone. My name is Sepida Pakpur. I'm
assistant professor at the School of Engineering as part of the mechanical and biomedical program on the Okanagan campus. So my lab is called Biomedical Microbiome Research. You've already heard amazing stuff from Carolina about microorganisms and the microbiome in the gut. I'm going to expand it and then just kind of link it to other kind of habitats. So this is the group I have, as, as uh, mentioned, all of the most of the work we do is an interdisciplinary or interdisciplinaries. And my group is also encompassed and in, is uh, interdisciplinary members from the cancer cell biology engineers, all of them working together to answer one question. So in general, what we do, we use technologies, advanced technologies to understand or find biomarkers, find the specific uh, signals into biological or environmental samples. But at the same time, we, we develop technologies to actually make these um, um, uh, assessments or findings more accurate. What we do, we look at the microorganisms in different habitats, either in the human or actually in the gut, in the oral cavity, or in the environments that they've lived in. What is the major goal, we just kind of link this basic scientific discoveries into applications, applications to medicine or even biomaterials and, and for different fields. So as you've already heard, we have a concept is called human microbiome. What it is, it's just not only exists in your gut, it's all around your body, it's on your skin, it's your oral cavity, and you are right now sharing your microorganisms with your friends sitting beside you or your family members right now. As you know, it's kind of, they are helping you, they just kind of keep you alive, keep you healthy, they protect you against pathogens. And they are very, are very unique in terms of your microorganisms. And it's like your fingerprints. And if I have your microbiome data and if I get your cell phones, swap them, there's high chance that I can identify whose cell phone is for who. I don't want to talk about human microbiome in this specific project it, 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 in talk because I knew that Carolina is going to cover that one, but mostly I'm going to talk about one of the sources that can shape or affect human microbiome biome and it's called your home environment your actual main place that you live in we know that human beings have been trapped in indoor spaces in the last two years you have experienced a pandemic that you were mostly spending your time in indoor spaces and uh, you you all of you guys have heard that over oh, mask when you're indoor spaces that higher infectious happens within their indoor spaces it means that in this indoor environment we have also this community of microorganisms either shedded by yourself your pets they are coming from outdoors and there is a community of them the whole indoor air quality of the buildings are, um, is, is an important, it's a public health problem. And uh, we, with a group of scientists, we formed a, a kind of a consortium that we just try to understand what, uh, what are the factors for shaping a healthy building? What do we mean with a healthy building? And we found that there are different attributes and a kind of um, um, a healthy building should have a high, very good air quality, uh, low microorganisms, a very very nice lighting components and um, noise is an important con attribute but so far all scientists are engineers are working on a specific part of this uh, graph and they're trying to work and uh, modify this aspect of the buildings to, so that they can positively impact the, um, the uh, occupants health and productivity focusing on the microorganisms of the indoor spaces you may tell me that Sepide, what do you mean? Where are these? And I would say, uh, look at around you. If there is a little bit of dust, a tiny amount of it, grab it. I will look at it under the X-ray microtomography. It's a 3D structure of a dust. It's beautiful. It's like a sky full of stars, but these are all skin flakes. These are hyphae of the fungi. These are microorganisms that can actually start growing and they can actually start producing toxins. Is there a way that we can engineer this? Is there a way that I can keep the specific microorganisms that I'm interested in and I remove the pathogen one or that they are um, just kind of risky for my health? So I go back to my the initial graph I showed you. I know that light is an important factor of uh, each building. And I know that they, by kind of modifying the light, it affects the serotonin, it affects the mood, it affects the uh, kind of a sleep quality. And at the same time, as a biologist, we know that the kind of light can impact the microorganisms. 
Within indoor spaces, there are specific pathogens that they are risky. They are we don't want them, especially in the healthcare facility, healthcare systems. We wanted to know that how we can by changing the lighting the system affects the growth of the microorganisms within the building. So, like somehow passively, we um, kind of uh, we, we 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 stop their growth. With the help of engineers, we just kind of built up this mini lab in the in um, and that we can actually manipulate type of light. It's like a small building, a small room that can be are controlling the humidity. We are controlling the relative uh, temperature and the solar si simulator on top is our uh, sun. And this chamber is, is like your room. I can change its lighting the window as a regular light uh, as a regular window and uh, you know you just look at me in my office this is beautiful outside but because of the heat and because of the extreme uh, amount of the light outside I, my blinds are down so i can't actually use the view or even i can't benefit from the light what we did we just kind of by changing the kind of uh, the uh, chemical compositionality of the windows we wanted to know that can we change type of lights coming in the in indoor spaces or not so we did that we showed that as the regular windows if um, we have a spectrum of the light in indoor spaces as soon as you have the blind you can reduce the amount or the intensity of the light but the spectrum or the characteristic of the light doesn't change but with our research with our industry members we found that I was a specific kind of compositionality on the surface of these windows, you can change the type of the wavelengths bringing in into spaces. And interestingly, they call blue lights. And we know that blue lights can affect microorganisms. So we went further so that all, and studies have shown that by having these windows, occupants have higher productivity, they are happier, they are just kind of, they have a much better sleep quality. So we took it this further and we wanted to know that how it impacts microorganisms, specifically on those microorganisms that they are hazardous. And we grow them, we just put them on different surface materials as if it's in the hospital setting, and we showed that actually they are effective. So it's in a very simple way of visualizations. If it is my building, my room has this bacterium inside, and um, I put my blinds down, the light, they will grow uh, extensively, especially if they are on the surface of the blind. But if I have the light in, uh, outside and I let it get in, the actual light can actually remove them because of the high intensity. And if I use these smart glasses, not only I can get rid of the uh, high heat amount that I can save my myself and actually being more productive, but also I can remove the bacterium from my room. And it was the kind of um, um, and what this effect was common for all different bacteria. How it can impact the, our society, they actually leads to every single of these bacterium. Actually, it's a burden for uh, our health system. And then hopefully we're just changing the structure of the windows and then type of lighting, we can actually affect the, um, um, reduce them from indoor spaces. How about viruses? Can we do something about viruses i would say yes especially this is a hot topic these days and um, and uh, but what about the airborne one i talked about the surface microorganisms so what about the microorganisms in, in the air so the air is encompassed different particles it just kind of it's the very kind of kind of different size range and the viruses are the very very small component of it Usually they are in droplets. So one approach was to find out, okay, how we can they kind of um, remove the viruses using light. The response was very positive by bringing more blue light, you're able to actually reduce their viability. But is it possible that we develop, so we develop a specific technology that can you that can use these air samples and, um, and we use that as a population-wide edit? system. So what does it mean if I have a technology in my office, it can get these air samples and then um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm separate the viruses within it, identify them and measure them. And if it gets to a specific concentration, warn us that actually this is not a health healthy environment now, and maybe we have to do some managements. Within this technology that we have developed, there is a novelty, it's called magnetic levitation system. You may ask me, what is this? I would say the same system that actually SkyTrains are, uh, are using. This is 
a system that you're trying to levitate the organism um, um, kind of a compound uh, from surface. And uh, we have developed the same system that we are levitating the biomolecules and uh, how the levitation happens, we just separate them and they're based on their density. So if I take a bacterium and put a gene that actually is fluorescent, if I glow a, a light to it, you can see that as soon as I put the bacterium within the system, there is a magnetic in what kind of this force around it, and it's just kind of levitates all the bacterium to a specific location, and whatever that is denser, um, from this particle, it will end up being in the, the uh, below this line, and then what is that is lighter, it goes higher. What is the resolution? The actually the density, the difference, the resolution is between 0 0.01 and um, gram per cubic meter. You can have this; it, um, you are able to separate the particles. This is one thing that we were, we were trying to actually isolate and detect viruses. How about they end up on the surface? Can we actually uh, deactivate them independent of the light? So in collaboration with that other lab, it just kind of that they are using um, the microwave sensor. We are embedding a specific wires within the materials that as soon as they are um, in a kind of with the microwave sensing, it heats up. It's like your, it's a shield, it's a trans transparent shield and uh, if the virus is on the surface of this because of the heating up and the specific compositionality, chemical compositionality of the surface, you are able to degrade them and remove them. This was a very brief snapshot of the projects we are doing in, the, in my lab and I will be more than happy to answer any questions of yours if, uh, if you have and you can contact me either through email or Twitter or uh, LinkedIn. Take care of yourself. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we have a few minutes left for one more research spotlight. So I'm going to add and have perfect. All right. And and how if you're ready, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me well. Uh, I'm Antao. I'm a second year graduate student from Dr. Jane Hill's lab, uh, chemical and biological engineering department. Uh, I'm going to share about our re uh, group's research on breast-based diagnosis of uh, respiratory infections. Uh, so yeah, you can see this is our lab. We are uh, also an interdisciplinary team with uh, 12 uh, group members, and we have engineer, computer scientist, chemist, bio biologist, uh, statistician, physician, the project coordinator. Uh, what we do, uh, in one sentence, we use breath to diagnose respiratory disease. Um, uh, so, okay, sorry. Uh, so why uh, respiratory disease detection is so uh, important? Uh, because uh, respiratory disease are still a global, global health threat. Uh, as you can see on the right, uh, from the data from World Health Organization, lower respiratory infections and tuberculosis are still uh, leading causes of death in lower middle uh, income countries. Uh, however, many of the uh, disease have uh, challenges in diagnosis. Uh, you may ask, uh, do we already have those diagnostic tools? Uh, yes, we have several. Uh, for example, microbioculture, which is a gold standard of my, many respiratory disease. Um, however, it usually requires sputum, uh, which is not always produced and is time-consuming procedure. Also for bloodly fluid, for example, blood, it is an uh, invasive uh, procedure, and people have been using uh, molecular methods such as uh, PCR uh, to, uh, to uh, diagnose disease. It is very sensitive, and uh, however, sometimes it still requires uh, the isolates from uh, microbial culture. So that means it is still time consuming. And uh, if you look at the uh, time of diagnosis, it may be longer than you have expected. For example, for TB, it can take as long as five weeks. And for uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria, it can take six months. So, you know, time is so uh, vital for the treatment. So I, uh, that's why it is necessary to develop a novel or faster uh, diagnostic tools. Uh, so we use breath, uh, which is um, non-invasive. Uh, it is pain-free. It contains information of the whole body. It has an uh, infinite source, so you can uh, take multiple samples per day, and it's easy to access. Um, basically, we collect 
uh, patient brands and we do uh, biomarker discovery and then we do biomarker validation. Uh, first, we collect these uh, the breath samples into the tidal lab bags from the patients using a, a specific device. And then, then we concentrate the breath samples to the thermal desorption tubes, which is packed with adsorbents, so which can retain the molecules in the breath. Um, and then we analyze the breath uh, samples using this two-dimensional gas chromatography with this time of flight mass spectrometry. And what you can get is uh, uh, chromatograms contain thousands of peaks, and each peak represents one chemical compound. And last, we use a lot of math and data science tools to do uh, very cool uh, biomarker discoveries, and then we can select those uh, indicators or biomarkers for a specific disease. Um, so that is a brief introduction to our group's research, and thanks to my uh, supervisor and all my group members and I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. So I am going to bring all of our researchers back onto the stage right now. Uh, perfect. Uh, I think I got everyone back on stage. Uh, so there are a few questions that have come in. So one question that I have for uh, John, that uh, what would be some applications of electrical engineering in the biomedical field? So maybe you could just elaborate a little bit on some of the areas that a student could look forward to being a part of. Absolutely. It's a very good question. And <clears throat> one's initial thought would not be that electrical engineering had anything to do with biomedical, but actually uh, we have about 50 professors in electrical and computer engineering. And I would say about a third of them work on biomedical problems. And what sort of problems? Well, uh, some of the very common things are if you take an X-ray or um, MRI, interpreting that is not easy. And so you can use uh, image analysis techniques that are common in electrical engineering and computer engineering to analyze that and figure out, okay, what is bone? What is tissue? Where where perhaps uh, is, uh, how do we then line that up, for example, with, um, with uh, the surgeon? How do we indicate to the surgeon uh, what shape of bone implant or hip implant might be needed? How do we relate that information to a robot, uh, a robotic um, surgeon assistant? So there's a lot of work on medical robotics um, new devices. One of our colleagues has, or two of our colleagues in electrical engineering, uh, and one of them is uh, also in mechanical engineering, have developed a way of ultrasound imaging using um, just a, a flat, a flexible tape, uh, which is much less expensive and could potentially even be implanted. Um, then there's how do you get, if you have implanted devices that might be monitoring within the body, how do you get signals and power in and out? So wireless power transfer, wireless low power communications, um, the whole area of artificial intelligence and machine learning is very useful in medical device and, and, and medical applications. And that's an area that a number of uh, you know, lots of engineers are strong in and, and particularly in computer engineering. So there are many, many ways that that electrical engineers can uh, either on their own or in collaboration with biomedical engineers, doctors, etc., uh, can contribute a lot to medical problems. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And the next question I have is for uh, step day. So uh, we only were kind of running out of time, so we need to keep the answer short. But do different climates or seasonal changes also have an effect on the antimicrobial properties of daylight? Uh, is there potential? Oops, sorry, I just lost it. Is there potential artificial lighting to be used to control microbes? 
Those questions are amazing. In terms of the seasonality, because we are text testing an indoor environment and in, uh, kind of, uh, we just kind of, uh, we have um, controlled relative humidity and temperature. Everything depends on the outdoor light. And then we didn't find major differences in the amount of the blue light we are bringing inside in terms of seasonality. So I would say that the antimicrobial uh, uh, changes would, wouldn't have wouldn't change significantly. But the second question, Erin, I can't recall the second one. What was that? Um, the second part of the question was just asking if there's artificial light sources that could do the same sort of Yes, there are. There are uh, kind of UV related type of lights, but uh, some of them are not uh, safe to use. But uh, there are some of them that you can, that it's uh, commercially even available. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I think our last question for this session is going to go to Scott. So uh, a question was about, um, could a computer engineer be involved with your research program? So looking at a lot of the uh, research that you shared of uh, the computer related pieces and all of that sort of fun stuff, if you could kind of elaborate on maybe some of the interdisciplinary aspects of the research that you work on. Yeah, maybe just to keep the answer short, um, definitely, yes. <laughs> um, I would love to get a computer engineer involved in my in my research group. Uh, we have We have too many people in my group who are just interested in rocks and dirt. So people who have skills with computers are highly, highly valued in this, in this, uh, in this world. Um, and it, you know, um, things that John touched on in terms of applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence are, are things that we're working on as well. Um, and then just being able to code uh, the types of numerical simulations that I was showing uh, in one, one slide there, um, really valuable. Um, so, some of these, um, some of these uh, applications can become commercial software. And so uh, enterprising computer engineer who wants to, uh, to go into developing their own software, there are uh, you know, thousands of applications in geological engineering and geohazards research. Wonderful. So I'm going to wrap up the session with that. So huge thank you to all of our research spotlights that were here today. Uh, you all did a wonderful job and I learned so much today even. So thank you so much for sharing that.